Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us at, um, at our conference on international um, investment law, specifically investor-state arbitration between developed democracies, a policy under challenge. Uh, this is a conference brought to you by the Canadian, um, the um, CG, the Centre for International Governance Innovation, and specifically the International Law Research Program of CG. Um, this project has been led by Armand Demetral. Um, he is a senior fellow with the International Law Research Program at CG. He's also the Jean Monnet Chair in Law of International Economic Integration at McGill University. And Armand has put together this program for today with uh, experts from around the world who are going to discuss different dimensions of this question of investor state arbitration between developed democracies. And um, so the program, you, you all have a copy of that. It's divided up into five panels um, with an introduction to start the day by Armand. And then uh, we have a, a lunch speaker who is the um, ambassador of the European Union, Marianne Konings, who will also um, discuss this issue from a European perspective. So I think we're going to have a really interesting day. Um, you're also lucky to have both electronic copies as well as um, uh, hard copies, if you wish, wish to have them, of all the papers. Um, so these are all draft papers, and they are being uh, reviewed tomorrow in a, in a closed workshop with the authors and the, um, the chief editor on the project. And um, the first result that will come from that is uh, papers like this. You saw one of them was published, the first one. Um, and there'll be a series of papers like this, and then we're also hoping to put them together in a, in a compilation uh, as a book. So. Um, that's all I have to say. I will just, let me give you a more formal introduction to Armand. Um, so I mentioned he's a senior fellow. He's been with us for over a year now. He is Professor Emeritus, and as I mentioned, the Jean Monnet Chair in the Law of International Economic Integration at McGill University. He teaches several courses, including Law of the Sea, Public International Law, International Trade Law, International Arbitration, European Union Law, and Public International Air Law. Uh, Professor Demetral's research focuses on areas of international trade law, law of regional economic integration, European community law, Canadian and comparative constitutional law, international environmental law, and international humanitarian law and human rights. Um, I would also um, like to mention that um, today there'll be lots of opportunity for you to ask questions. So we're going to keep all the presentations fairly short. Um, and if the, the speakers feel a little frustrated by being confined to a short presentation, there will be an opportunity at the end. Um, the last hour and a half will be an open discussion with all the panelists, and you, you will have an opportunity to pose questions to, um, to the speakers then as well. So during the, during the conference, um, after, this, after each panel speaks, you'll have an opportunity to pose questions live. Um, and in that last panel, we'd ask that you prepare a written question, and then we'll sort through them, and we can hopefully get through more questions that way. Okay, um, I failed to introduce myself. I'm Una Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the International Law Research Program at CG, and I'm very happy to be here. So without more, I'll turn to Ahmad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Una, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, if I may, I'll, I'll say a few words about, again, about the organization of the day and brief, very briefly introduce the, uh, the, the general topic. Uh, you have a, an order of proceedings. You also have uh, biographies of all our participants and our speakers. Uh, just to say, the, the morning sessions will be focusing on the experience with investor state arbitration uh, in a number of jurisdictions. We have a very comparative approach, uh, and we have presentations from the Antipodes to Canada. Uh, passing through Europe and the United States. Um, so, the, so the focus of the morning and three panels in the morning is on 
uh, national experience, uh, the debate, the academic response, uh, public criticism, etc. Uh, this afternoon, in the afternoon, we'll be looking at broader questions. One of them being, do the kinds of incremental changes that have been cre creeping into recent uh, investor-state arbitration uh, clauses and investment protection agreements generally? Uh, respond to the concerns of both the public, and the ac and academic, and uh, governmental uh, levels. Uh, we also uh, are looking uh, at uh, the question of how this fits into the broader picture, because we're, we're focusing on the, per the propriety of investor state arbitration between developed democracies, but obviously that we cannot ignore the broader international debate. And so there, we've devoted a panel uh, to the question of what would be the response of the rest of the world where a number of developed democracies like Canada, US, Japan, the EU, et cetera, to uh, simply withdraw among between themselves from investor state arbitration. Uh, and then we have a final hour and a half question and answer session and as Una pointed out, we have a very tight uh, timetable for all our panels, and you may find yourselves frustrated and not being able to ask the questions you would like to ask, uh, but there will be an hour and a half uh, where you as the audience will have your chance to put these questions, and I hope also that our panelists will feel that they have an opportunity to add certain points and say more things than they would have liked to say in their short presentations. Um, at noon, of course, we're fortunate to have an address from Her Excellency, the Ambassador to the European Union. Uh, and of course, this is a jurisdiction in which Canada has recently signed a major trade treaty, including investor state arbitration. Uh, and in both jurisdictions, Canada, the EU, there has been and is a debate about investor state arbitration. And in many senses, we have, we share common concerns. And I think that's reflected in the drafting of the uh, CETA. Uh, now, I would, if you haven't already had time to do so, and warmly invite you to uh, read the many papers that have been prepared. Uh, they are designed to reflect the experience of various countries, various developed democracies with respect to investor state uh, arbitration. And they're all available to you. They're available uh, uh, either on online or uh, in print uh, form. Uh, and uh, it's my hope that they will be published as CETA papers pending uh, once the final re review and the authors have had a chance to uh, review them and make further any further changes they deem necessary. And I hope that, as Una suggested, we will also be able to put out a collective volume uh, reflecting the interest of the subject and the quality of the, of the papers. Uh, as a general background paper, you have, in fact, the first CG uh, paper in which I've attempted to review the, the range of concerns that have been leveled against I, ISA, both by experts and in the public domain. And the paper, my paper attempts to present the many answers that have been given to the, these criticisms and the many sol solutions that have been proposed in recent years. And the paper also reviews the response of governments, particularly of Canada, to NAFTA and its subsequent practice uh, in dealing with NAFTA and other more recent uh, agreements, as well as suggesting uh, possible courses of action most readily available to develop democracies at the present time. Uh, a second paper I've done looks in more detail uh, at how Canada has responded to public pressures and criticisms of investor state arbitration, particularly in dealing with NAFTA cases and in preparing its model FIPA and negotiating subsequent uh, agreements, uh, especially CETA, whose drafting appears designed to protect the capacity of governments to adopt regulatory measures uh, uh, and 
goes further than any previous text in, in doing this. Uh, a third paper that I've prepared that is available to you looks at the question posed by the assertion one often hears that everything should be left to domestic courts, particularly Canadian courts, and that these courts should can and should provide equally effective remedies uh, in action and damages. Uh, in the Canadian case, unfortunately, perhaps the answer is simple. the short answer is no, but I put the caveat that this answer can vary a lot from one country to another. Uh, and then the final paper picks up from the first paper and tries to set out the possible courses of action that seem realistically available uh, to the government of Canada. Now, just generally, should developed democracies abandon recourse to investor state arbitration between themselves on the ground that it's neither necessary nor appropriate? This is a central question of the day. And there's a strong current of opinion that would approve this approach. Uh, there's been a debate in Canada almost from the moment that Chapter 11 of NAFTA was adopted in 1993. After all, it was designed to discipline Mexico. Excuse me, uh, Hugo. Uh, no foreign investor was ever supposed to sue the government of Canada, or still less the government of the United States. But they've done so. Um, and interestingly, I think Canada has produced some of the most principled critics of investor state arbitration and some of the most extensive uh, critical writing. Um, and indeed, I know we're in an election campaign, I should be careful, but uh, it, I think it's fair to say one national political leader has consistently taken the position, contrary to investor state arbitration, since her days as the leader of a major environmental organization. Uh, and many see investor state arbitration as a privileged legal remedy given to foreign investors. They're also concerned that the remedy appears to reflect private rather than public justice, even though it deals with a mix of public and private issues. Uh, I think it's fair to say Canada witnessed the first real debate in developed democracies over the propriety of investor state arbitration, but the debate has spread to other developed democracies. As you'll hear today, uh, Australia was perhaps the first to be con uh, so concerned that it declined to include investor state arbitration in a major trade agreement with the United States in 2004. Subsequently, Australia appears to have adopted a more pragmatic position. European Union, whose member states invented investor state arbitration, has witnessed a very hot debate over the propriety of recourse uh, to investor state arbitration with the United States and to a lesser extent Canada, since the EU has acquired competence over direct foreign investment in 2009. The debate has raged particularly in the European Parliament, but also in some of the member states such as Germany and France. And there's currently a petition in, against investor state arbitration in the TTIP with the United States signed by several million Europeans. Uh, the fear of litigation with American companies seems to have elicited great concern not only within the EU but also in Japan, where opposition to investor state arbitration focuses on the TPP almost entirely in its relation aspect with the United States and seems to neglect other countries. Uh, You'll also hear about the experience of countries in Eastern Europe, Spain, Korea, uh, and uh, in dealing with investor state cases. So today's discussion focuses very much on the debate in developed democracies, but we cannot, of course, neglect the wider global situation where some countries have expressed opposition to investor state arbitration or are in process of changing their, their approach to investment protection agreements. So is the debate over? Should developed democracies abandon investor state arbitration between themselves and perhaps in all their treaties? I leave it to you to make up your minds at the end of the day. But in defense of investor state arbitration, several things must be said. Criticisms of in developed democracies have focused almost entirely on perceived objections when developed democracy governments are sued in the EU and Japan, almost entirely on the fear of the United States. Curiously, we Canadians don't seem to suffer from the fear of the United States quite as much as others. Perhaps we have 
more experience in dealing with Americans. Um, and I think it's fair to say most critics virtually neglect the fact that the network of bilateral investment treaties and now investment chapters in regional trade agreements are designed to protect foreign investments that investors abroad. Uh, Canadian foreign investors in distant parts of the world where courts and governments do not always respect the rule of law welcome the protection. Critics tend to focus on only one side of the equation. Another point that must be made is that international investment protection law is not fixed in time. It's constantly changing. If the concern is that investor state arbitration inhibits the regulatory process and allows foreign investors an unreasonable right to challenge domestic regulatory policies, critics would do well to examine carefully the changes made to model investment protection agreements, such as the US or Canadian models, as well as the many proposals for further change. Compare the procedural innovation we have that have been made to the practice of NAFTA Chapter 11 or which have been written into later agreements by Canada and other developed democracies. Consider the major exceptions, public policy protections, and other substantive changes that have been written into the CETA text by Canada and the EU, who appear to share very similar concerns. Much has changed. The substantive and procedural law is not static. There are important proposals to amend the ICSID review committee process. The EU has just last we proposed a court and appellate process for the TTIP. Further point that must be made is that developed democracy governments have lost few cases. US, for example, has never lost a case. Finally, there's the need to ask why and how we've got in the position we're in. NAFTA Chapter 11 was adopted due to the concern, perhaps exaggerated, that the USA and Canada were being joined by a major developing country. For the EU, the concern is largely derived from the need to conclude the International Energy Charter, most of which of necessity must include both EU member states, but also a number of important energy producing uh, countries of the Caucasus and Central Asia. Would it have been possible for Canada and the USA and the EU to exclude ISA between themselves and maintain it for the, all these other countries? This is a complex and uncomfortable question that will be addressed today. In conclusion, I urge you to read the many papers that have been prepared. I look forward to your questions during the day. Ce colloque se déroule en anglais, mais la plupart de nos conférenciers peuvent répondre à vos questions en français, et on s'efforcera évidemment de répondre en français aux questions qui seraient posées en français. So, uh, bon colloque. I hope you enjoy this conference, and I invite the well. I have the members of the panel and I will open it right away. I might say, and I, this would be an invitation to our uh, uh, panel uh, chairs, we have a list of uh, speakers with uh, their bios. I think I will refrain from making the kind of kind invita uh, uh, description of uh, each uh, panelist, and I invite, uh, in order to save time, I invite other panelists to, to do the same. We are indeed fortunate to have a group of very distinguished uh, academic and professional uh, participants who have prepared papers and who are presenting today. And indeed, I, I have to say, some of them are, are so distinguished and so active that they're not able to be with us today. One of them is in an arbitration in, in Washington and couldn't leave. Another is delivering a paper in, in Europe. Uh, but we're fortunate that equally distinguished and able uh, colleagues have been able to replace them, and um, uh, so we are able to proceed with a, a full conference. So, bon colloque, and I thank you very much. So, all right, without further ado, uh, I would invite uh, our panelists, we, our focus in this first panel is on the reaction to investor state arbitration in Canada and the United States. And we have three very able and distinguished panelists. Uh, I, as I say, I will forbear from, I would refer you to the speakers' uh, bios here. Uh, we're very fortunate that all of them have been able to join us. And 
I think I, I will invite uh, David Gantz uh, of the University of Arizona to uh, lead off. Can I get my PowerPoint up there? Sure. <laughs> PowerPoint. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, this this is uh, a paper, obviously, on looking at it <coughs> at ISDS under U.S. law, politics and practice. Uh, uh, just keeping in mind, the U.S. was something of a latecomer to the BIT movement. We didn't really start concluding them until the early 1980s, which is almost 10 years after some of the European countries. Um, the U.S. Once it decided to go forward, became a very strong supporter of doing these uh, ISDS uh, provisions and in bilateral investment treaties. Uh, a large part of it for the U.S. at that time was to replace formal or informal espousal, which got the U.S. government heavily involved every time there was a major investment dispute, um, which, was all, which was a real mess in Latin America, particularly with Peru and Ecuador, and also having uh, pushed very hard in the 60s and the early 70s for the broader acceptance of the concept that international law requires prompt, adequate, and effective compensation, it was considered a big plus to have these concepts uh, wide, more widely um, accepted. NAFTA, of course, was a transformative experiment for um, uh, process for the U.S. as well as Canada. As far as I can tell, everybody was tr uh, assuming that all of the investor state disputes would be between U.S. and Canadian investors and Mexico. Surprise, surprise, it didn't happen that way. They were pretty, they've been pretty evenly distributed uh, among the three uh, NAFTA parties as respondents. Um, in the the internal political process, the BITs have not been very controversial, partly because they only have to be approved as treaties by uh, two-thirds of the Senate, uh, with the idea of incorporating them into trade agreements like Chapter 11 of NAFTA. They get caught up in the broader debate over pros and cons of trade agreements and all the, uh, all the issues that arise from there. Um, again, the formal in a spousal concept wasn't that common, um, you know, after the uh, 20s and 30s, uh, but informal espousal by the State Department uh, with these disputes in the 60s and 70s was quite common. I spent seven years in the legal advisor's office at the State Department in the early 1970s, and most of my time was spent trying to resolve investment disputes uh, in Latin America. Uh, the U.S. government negotiated many settlements, particularly in Peru and Ecuador, pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this whole process was accompanied uh, by threats of sanctions, the Hickenlooper Amendment, cutting off foreign aid, cutting off support in the international financial institutions, and the result typically was that these disputes tended to dominate bilateral relations, and, and if the country like Peru or Ecuador happened to be a member of the um, Organization of American States, um, the U.S. Um, uh, delegate was frequently subjected to not entirely unreasonable charges of economic coercion. I spent a lot of time listening to those issues many years ago. And you had this rather strange uh, process, at least for, from the point of view of a lawyer and due process, of relatively young State Department lawyers listening to an American um, company um, complaining about his treatment in uh, a particular country and then trying to decide whether those uh, complaints were valid and uh, becoming an advocate uh, essentially on that uh, entity's uh, behalf. Um, so it wasn't really surprising that beginning with Reagan, um, then the first Bush administration, the Clinton administrations, everyone in, that, in those groups uh, became relatively enthusiastic supporters of concluding uh, bilateral investment treaties, uh, all of them, at least for the U.S., with um, ISDS. Um, there, the process evolved slowly. Some of you are familiar with the multiple model BITs that came out every few years, typically. Uh, most of the changes, at least until 2002, were um, relatively minor. Um, and um, in almost all of these BIT situations, the other party was a small developing country or a medium-sized developing country where 
although the agreements were totally reci reciprocal, the chances of, for example, in the most recent ones, um, an investor from Uruguay suing the U.S. government under the BIT that was concluded a decade or so ago were really pretty small, if not totally insignificant. Um, NAFTA, of course, was a big change. Um, despite the assumptions, the U.S. has been um, uh, uh, asked to, uh, to or noticed to go to arbitration and close to 20 cases, although not all of them went forward. Um, and uh, it, you looked at the, if you looked at the NAFTA negotiations and some of the statements, this was a big part of what uh, President Salinas and his colleagues wanted to uh, see happen in order to encourage investment, the transfer of technology, creation of jobs. And so it wasn't one of these situations, as far as I can tell, where Canada and the U.S. forced um, investor state dispute settlement on Mexico. It was accepted, uh, if not enthusiastically, certainly as an integral part of uh, a package that was going to, and has successfully, I think, uh, increased investment uh, in Mexico, exports, and all of those other positive um, things. Uh, there wasn't, there, there were some um, innovation in Chapter 11, but a lot of it just followed uh, some of the earlier model BIT uh, experiences. Um, and again, uh, for the U.S., at least for some officials, the idea that Mexico, long a proponent of the Calvo Clause, was willing to accept ISDS was also considered a major diplomatic victory in the U.S. Um, but of course, as we all know, whether you're a government lawyer or a private lawyer, nothing clears the mind like being the respondent in a major case, particularly one that has a very high profile where uh, losing it can adversely affect your career uh, or your ability to get clients. Uh, and by 2000, there were multiple cases obviously pending against all three NAFTA parties. Um, and the governments, I think, uni uni uh, uniformly uh, decided that there had been some things about NAFTA that ought to be changed in the future. Um, the breadth of fair and equitable treatment, uh, an interesting uh, concept where the governments unanimously decided that uh, nothing had changed in this particular area of customary international law since the near case in 1926, while almost all of the uh, arbitrators except for one or two cases, said, no, 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 there's been an evolution, and uh, you don't have to have a situation that totally shocks the conscience or is outrageous before you have liability. Um, and the whole area of regulatory takings, which we see so, uh, so mo most recently in the uh, Bitcom case. Um, so by, in the U.S., by the time, and particularly with, with Methanex, the case in California, by the time of the Trade Promotion Authority, the authorization that the U.S. government needs uh, in order to implement, effectively implement um, uh, free trade agreements. Uh, it doesn't affect uh, BITs at all uh, in a significant way, except the same basic theories apply. Uh, by the time we were doing new agreements under the second Bush administration with Chile and Singapore, they were trying to redefine concepts, especially to deal with regulatory, um, regulatory takings, the rare circumstances language that if it's non-discriminatory, regulatory actions protecting things like public welfare and pu safety and the environment, particularly the environment, are not indirect expropriation. That was one area. Um, and then this whole area of fair and equitable treatment, uh, customary international law minimum standard, um, eh, don't have to do anything beyond what is required by that standard. The problem is it doesn't tell you what customary international law is. And um, I think most um, commentators and certainly the vast majority of arbitrators, other than the Glamis Gold uh, uh, case uh, in the U.S., um, see it as an evolving process that is affected, among other things, by 3,000 BITs and all of these what, some 600 um, ISDS cases uh, that we know about. Um, so, um, and the, one of the interesting things that, uh, is that uh, there was an uh, effort to adopt uh, U.S. Supreme Court litigation. How much time? Okay. U.S. Supreme Court litigation um, from the Penn Central Transportation Company case. It's not so surprising that this is brought into the um, U.S. Uh, 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 invest, uh, investor state uh, chapters uh, 
uh, but it is also found in the Canadian agreements and this newest proposal that comes out of the European Commission, the informal proposal, also has the same language from Penn Central, which I find <coughs> sort of a creeping imperialism, uh, uh, but uh, a standard which obviously is very uh, desirable for uh, many, uh, for many uh, uh, lawyers in various jurisdictions. Um, and um, there was a huge fuss again when the Congress changed in 2006 and from that time on the FTAs uh, said that foreign investors in the United States will not be accorded greater substantive rights than they get under the Fifth Amendment and other um, guarantees, legal and constitutional, uh, in um, the United States. And this, this appears in agreements with Korea, Colombia, Peru, and, um, and uh, uh, Panama, and it almost certainly will appear in the Trans-Pacific Partnership language as well. Um, again, they changed, they, they redid the, uh, the model BIT in uh, 2012. It took about a three-year period under the Obama administration. Not really many changes except a few on the periphery. Uh, there was a huge debate, as some of you know, uh, earlier this year over renewing trans the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and ISDS was one issue, but only one of several issues uh, uh, that um, uh, was part of the discourse, and it really wasn't that different than uh, the NAFTA debate. Uh, if you go back and look at Ross Perot when he was running for president, uh, you'll see a lot of the same language. Uh, as usual, a lot of Democrats, labor unions, and environmental groups don't like trade and investment agreements at all, not just the ISDS, but many other uh, concerns about encouraging job losses for American workers in the world environment. Um, sorry. Um, again, there's a, there was a, a fairly sophisticated de debate by some people who are sitting in this room, uh, some who are not, over um, the original objectives, including getting the U.S. government the heck out of the business of negotiating these issues, and others like the uh, Cato Institute, Simon Lester, saying, well, it's part of the risks of uh, investing in countries with weak rule of law, buy political risk insurance from OPIC, unlike the Exim Bank, that agency still exists. Um, and a few, but very few, says, well, let's try to improve the process. At least the European Union is, is looking at it from that point of view rather than totally uh, uh, getting rid of the whole idea. Um, but again, it seems to me, given my background, that if you get rid of ISDS, the State Department will be back in the business inevitably of negotiating these agreements simply because um, congressional and business enterprise pressure will be overwhelming. Otherwise, what in the future, again, we're hopeful that the Trans-Pacific Partnership will be done in a few weeks. Uh, I think the language is pretty much going to be the same as we've seen in recent agreements. Um, it'll look very much like the Korea Agreement, for example. They're trying to negotiate uh, a BIT with China. Uh, Canada did this a couple of years ago, but there's a lot in that agreement that the U.S. will never accept. Uh, it's a very complicated process because we all know that if there is ISDS, the U.S. will be respondent just as much as U.S. government official, as U.S. enterprises will be uh, uh, bringing cases. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see how that all goes. Um, TTIP, we'll t be talking about that later, so I'll just skip this part. Um, someday, I think the Commission will probably make a formal proposal, maybe by the end of this year, uh, whether the U.S. government and stakeholders will accept this idea of an investment court, I guess we'll talk about later in the day. Uh, and one of the concerns I have in the U.S. is whether U.S. stakeholders really care much about the TTA, TTIP uh, uh, investment and other provisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Sorry to rush you. I know there's a lot to be said. Right. Now I invite Charles Emmanuel Côte to speak from Canada. So you did not receive my PowerPoint. Don't worry. Don't look for it. I didn't send one. <laughs> Um, I will talk about the, the Canadian side of the story of, uh, of uh, inverse, investor state arbitration. I will start with uh, some, some data. Um, one in interesting point to, to, to make uh, at the outset is that 
for the moment, Canada is the most experienced developed democracy with investor state arbitration. No other developed democracy has faced as much claims uh, than Canada. So Canada can can claim to have the status of the most experienced developed democracy with investor state arbitration. Obviously, all claims were brought under NAFTA Chapter 11. All claims were brought by U.S. investor as well. For the moment, we have 22 claims that, that were brought. Um, most of these claims were uh, against environmental measure, unsurprisingly enough. Some claims were also about uh, uh, state-owned enterprises or public services. For the most part, the, the claims uh, uh, related to these uh, these issues, measures uh, relating to this, uh, these topics. Um, in addition to those 22 claims, uh, there are probably 15, but Arma and I disagree on the exact amount of notice of intent to submit claims to arbitration, and the reason is that the, the, the data is not ex exactly uh, the same depending on what source you look in. I personally checked on the, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs website, and they list 15 notices of arbitration, of intent to submit claims to arbitration, but if you look on some other uh, uh, sources, you might see other, other, other uh, uh, notices that were not reported by the federal government. Those notices, even though they never led to an actual claim, they are part of the story because they might have fueled uh, fears of uh, investor state arbitration, even if they had actually no real legal basis, they were made, they were publicly available, and they might have raised fear as well. So out of those 22 claims, 11 are now uh, uh, closed, and Canada won seven and lost four. Um, the aggregate amount of claims that were brought against Canada, or the, including those that are still pending, is 8.1 billion US dollar. Uh, However, when you look at the actual damages that were awarded or the settlements that were reached between the parties, you, uh, you, uh, you, the, the number um, gets to 147 million US dollar, which equates to a mere 0.05% of all US investments in Canada. So that has to be put into perspective as well, like the, the amount of stocks of US investment in Canada versus the actual damages that were, that were uh, awarded against Canada. So my main point would be that overall the experience of Canada with investor state arbitration has not been as dark as one might think, even though there are some areas of concerns. And I will look at these, uh, at these uh, lessons that may be drawn in the few minutes that I have left, uh, the, the few lessons that may be uh, drawn from the Canadian experience. Like the US, and even uh, uh, later than the US, Canada has been also a late participant, a late bloomer in investor state uh, uh, arbitration or investment uh, treaties. Our first um, treaty was signed with the U.S. actually uh, in 1989 in the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. There was an ch investment chapter which did not include investor state arbitration but only disciplines on investment uh, uh, policy. Since then, Canada has signed 29 foreign investment uh, protection and promotion agreements, FIPAs, uh, all including investor state arbitration, seven of which are with developed democracy, all of which are former uh, central, uh, still central and eastern European countries that are now member of the, of the EU. Uh, we also have 11 free trade agreements in force, into force, uh, and uh, they do not systematically include an investment chapter or uh, uh, investor state arbitration. Out of these uh, 11 FTAs, we have four, uh, three FTAs that are with uh, developed democracies, NAFTA, obviously, but we also have a free trade agreement with EFTA countries, um, the European Free Trade Association, and this free trade agreement does not include an investment chapter. We also have a recent uh, free trade agreement with South Korea that includes a free trade, uh, uh, an investment chapter with ISA. We have obviously also under negotiations uh, uh, or that are not yet into force a couple of treaties, CETA with the EU that we've talked about already, TPP, Canada is participating, and also free trade negotiation with Japan, and I'm not sure exactly if there is uh, pro plans to have a, 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 a ISA or not, this, the, this data is not publicly available at the moment. Um, last important point uh, is that uh, in Canada, foreign uh, investment agreement, uh, FIPAs or FTAs are not part of the law of Canada. They may not be invoked before Canadian courts. 
So that is important in the discussion in, in order to know whether there is a, an additional protection that is granted to, uh, to foreign investor in Canada. But the disciplines uh, in the treaties may not be invoked directly before Canadian courts. Um, if I look quickly at the, in the time that I have left at the, the, some lessons that may be drawn from the Canadian experience, one thing that should not be forgotten is that a lot of, of, of the obligations that are provided for by these treaties are already binding on Canada in other ways. Uh, there are some, uh, of course, international customary law obligations that are already binding on Canada. There are some WTO uh, law obligations already binding on Canada that may be repeated in, in, uh, in, uh, in these treaties. There are also some, some we, we, we tend to forget, but there are some old um, treaties of uh, friendship, commerce, and navigation that were signed by the United Kingdom that are, sim that, that, that are still binding on Canada. Some, uh, some of them are still binding on Canada, uh, on Canada, and they do provide for disciplines as well uh, that might equate or echo what we find in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, investment agreements. Uh, another point is that uh, it could be, and that issue has to be looked, I guess, more into details, it could be that Canadian law does not offer always equivalent protection than you have in, in, in uh, investment treaties. We have had the case of abitibi Water with, uh, with the direct expropriation by a provincial uh, government where we face the limits of our, of our, of our uh, internal law facing these issues, and, and that shows that maybe there's a need for internal, in, international protection there. Um, we have a, a pending case now at the Quebec Superior Court that could be interesting in that regard as well. In the, in the um, Stratico Resources case, um, a Quebec mining company is suing now the, the, the Quebec government for 190 uh, million Canadian dollars uh, because it's uh, mining exploration uh, um, uh, operations were stopped by the provincial authorities for lack of social acceptability despite previous pre temporary authorization, despite uh, the Federal Nucle Nuclear Safety Commission approval of the project, and they're now testing the limits of the Canadian law in uh, the, Can the Canadian courts, and that might be interesting to see how, how far you can get protection. And this, the facts in that case uh, resemble to to facts that you might find in investor state arbitration. Um, quickly, maybe the two main problems that I see from the, um, the, uh, the, uh, in the experience of Canada in terms of substantive law, I believe that the uh, most favor nation clause uh, at the moment might be problematic. Uh, even though you might, in newer treaty, uh, limit the scope of most favored nation clause, that does not alter the fact that in previous treaties, like in NAFTA, for instance, you have an unlimited most favored nation clause. And that way, uh, even if you have treaty innovation for posterior treaties, the previous treaties are still, uh, uh, are still the, the MFN clause is still not limited. So in a lot of cases invest, uh, brought against Canada, investors do invoke uh, better treaty protection in previous uh, FIPAS, for instance, in order to bypass limitations that have been made in uh, later treaties. And I think that's an area of concern for, uh, for Canada and for most uh, developed democracy. I think that's a, it's an issue that has to be more looked into. Uh, there is no definite ruling, however, yet on if one might use uh, the MFN uh, clause in that respect. Each time the question was put before an arbitral tribunal, they decided to duck the issue and, and rule differently without saying that they refuse to, they, they accept either argument, just saying that they, 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 will, they refrain from ruling. Uh, obviously, the second area of concern is the fair and equitable treatment uh, clause. Um, I would say that we kind of witness a slow nullification of the notes of, arbit uh, the notes of interpretation that were adopted in 2001 to restrict the scope of the fair and equitable treatment uh, uh, protection in NAFTA. Why, why is that? Well, first of all, uh, with the, the idea that the content of, uh, and, and w which is, I guess, a right idea, that custom is not fixed in 1926 and is evolutionary, well, there are limits to what you can circumscribe at one moment. Uh, in 2001, uh, custom continues to evaluate. Uh, 
uh, to evolute. And um, what we see is that there seems to be less relevancy in this uh, specific notes of interpretation in, 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 in uh, recent uh, interpretation of the fair and equitable treatment. And of course, even if arbit arbitrators agree on uh, the content of, the, of, the, of customary protection, Still, what we see, and the Clayton Bilken case is, is, is the latest instance in that regard, what we witness is that this general protection is quite hard to apply to, to the facts, and arbitrators might completely disagree in applying the, 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 the fair and equitable treatment uh, protection to the, the facts, which leads to other problems. Um, Maybe another point that I find interesting uh, to, to stress, and there are so many other things I would like to say, but one interesting uh, issue is the denial, the use of denial of benefits clause. Canada has, in, his, in most of its treaties, uh, included the denial of benefits clause, like in NAFTA, allowing it to block claims by shell corporations, uh, control by uh, uh, third country foreign investors that have no substantial business in, say, the US. It, it, the clause was invoked outside legal uh, arbitration proceedings in one case, uh, and uh, it was successful enough to stop the proceedings. Uh, so it was invoked, it was not ruled on by arbitrators, but one should uh, nevertheless look at other instances in which outside NAFTA such clause were applied, importantly enough in the UCAS trilogy arbitration case, uh, the tribunal ruled that this could not be, this, such a clause could not be invoked retroactively. And that means that it's not clear how exactly such a denial of benefit clause has to be handled by, by, by uh, treaty, uh, uh, treaty uh, uh, parties. So that's uh, an area that has to be looked more into detail. Um, maybe the last experience in my minute, that is uh, the, the last minute I have, maybe even though the notes of interpretation for the fair and equitable treatment have proven to be of a limited uh, interest in time, um, I still believe that it's probably the most pragmatic mechanism to control uh, ISA at the moment, given the impracticability to modify most treaties that are already in force, uh, to introduce applet review, uh, etc. Probably that for the moment the most pragmatic solution is binding interpretation, and perhaps that uh, uh, countries should use more often binding interpretation in, in the operation of their treaties, and it has been, like you know, very scarcely used, at least, in fact, only twice by in NAFTA and for the Canada-Chile um, uh, free trade agreement. For the rest, it has never been used, and I believe it should be used more often. Um, yes, I will end here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I invite uh, David Schneiderman to take the floor. Good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but it feels like springtime in a Callowit in the room. It's so cold. Um, thank you very much to Armand and to uh, my co-panelists who've written some really excellent papers. Um, I've been asked to first talk about some of the critiques that have been generated by scholars and civil society, and then to turn to my paper if I have any time. Um, I should mention that the paper has not been circulated before, that is, you will have seen it for the first time, and so I very much welcome uh, comments, uh, criticisms, etc., cetera, um, genuinely so. Okay, so let me uh, briefly survey uh, criticisms that have arisen in, um, in response to ISDS, as uh, uh, Charles Emmanuel says, Canada was the first to experience um, ISDS as a developed state. Um, and so a lot of this criticism really took root here and circulated. One thinks of, for instance, the debates around the multilateral agreement on investment in the mid-90s. Much of the information, uh, arguments generated here circulated uh, uh, around the world to other states and social movement actors. Uh, so we've had a great deal of experience. Um, in fact, I think Judge Schwabel in a recent speech complains that 
it lays the blame for criticisms of ISDS at the feet of two Canadians. Any of you seen this? Um, and and I, 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 it might be Howard Mann. It might be Gus Van Harten. I'm not sure. And I'd flatter myself if I thought it included me. Um, so, okay. Uh, firstly, the regime, if I can call it that, is unstable and unpredictable. The uh, standards that are enforced by investment tribunals are vague, uncertain, and continually evolving, resulting in a lack of clarity for states. This is from Charles Emmanuel's paper, uh, talking about free, uh, fair and equitable treatment, which F.A. Mann in the 1980s said had no discernible content, but he was making proposals about what could fill in the content of that standard. Uh, uh, Charles Emmanuel describes as having a serious lack of legal predictability in his paper. Um, tribunals taking an expansionist, or as Jefferson called it, latitudinarian approach to interpreting these standards. Um, and I think that this was true at the outset. One thinks of, for instance, uh, the medical ad tribunal's um, definition of what is a compensable taking, the American uh, term. Um, which has been entirely overtaken, it seems to me, and Charles Emmanuel in his paper says the fears about expropriation or takings weren't realized. Well, that's because the expropriations, it seems to me, were entirely overtaken by fair and equitable treatment, which incorporated some of the considerations that go into um, determining whether there's been a compensable event. In other words, some of the Penn Central criteria that David Gantz mentioned reappear in fair and equitable treatment um, um, considerations. There's a structural tilt to the regime, and not surprisingly, right? The object and purpose is to facilitate capital movement. Um, there are claims about bias, hard to prove, and certainly hard to disprove. Um, there's certainly a selection bias uh, in choosing what law to source as informing the content of international investment law, selection bias, that is, that favors capital exporting states. Um, it's not the constitutional law of South Africa, for instance, which is circulating as a possible way of interpreting expropriations, right, which is very different, discordant with the trend lines in international investment law. And, but there are discernible systemic tendencies, um, uh, 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 and Gus Van Harten has done some recent work on this, 160 cases. He does content analysis um, of, of these decisions around jurisdiction and uh, substantive interpretation and finds that um, investors from capital exporting states um, in a statistically significant way are more favored by uh, tribunals. Uh, regula resulting in regulatory chill. Uh, this too is hard to prove. Some say you just count the number of disputes so there's no regulatory chill. Look at the few number of cases and the, of course, statute, statute books of and uh, uh, codified uh, regulations. Uh, the European Federation for International Law and Arbitration, I think it's EFILA, um, says you can't do this. Just give it up. There is no regulatory chill. And um, that doesn't sound right. Uh, we're, we get conflicting anecdotal accounts about what's going on. And certainly my um, uh, uh, introduction to international investment law occurred in 1994 uh, when the Canadian government considered adopting a plain packaging initiative in regard to the sale of tobacco products, which is, of course, a large controversy now, uh, disputes against Uruguay and, um, South and uh, Australia. Uh, it's forgotten that Canadians actually considered this very proposal and abandoned it for any number of reasons. And I think it's reasonable to assume that the threat by Carla Hills, former USTR, that three major American tobacco companies would sue for hundreds of million dollars would have been a factor right, in the Canadian government's determination to abandon the plain packaging initiative in 1994. Is the system then in crisis? Some people say it is. Sonaraja says yes. Um, and of course, there are um, uh, events in Germany and France, and we'll hear more about this, of course, as the day goes on. Uh, South Africa's withdrawing. India's offered a 
different kind of model, Brazil, something entirely different. But um, like most people in the room, I would think that it's not in crisis, actually. It's unlikely that the regime is going to simply disintegrate. Uh, that's because there are powerful economic interests um, and their lawyers, right, some of them gathered in the room, who will ensure that the regime continues on. It will be difficult, it seems to me, to dismantle um, uh, this um, global web, right, of uh, investment treaties, which does not explain the hyperbolic and vitriolic attacks launched against critics by international investment lawyers and arbitrators. It's very curious um, how angry um, some of these folks are, and I would refer you to the piece by Brower and Blanchard in the Columbia Journal of Transnational Law. It's just really inexplicable, um, the accusations that are being flown around, namely that you know we, Critics are misleading, liars, myth makers, etc. Okay, let me turn to my paper. Let's see how much time I have. Okay, I have about three minutes. So uh, the paper, after sort of listing in a short paragraph some of these criticisms, takes seriously democracy promoting rationales that have been offered by. Uh, tribunals and some investment scholars, democracy promoting rationales for ISDS. So this is a paper about democratic theory and listening to um, the complaint that investors have no voice in host state political processes. They're not represented, right? Because they're not represented, they're vulnerable to changes in state policy and targeting and it's the story of the obsolescing bargain, right? That investors are not going to be represented. Well, of course, companies, artificial persons, don't have a vote anyways in most jurisdictions. And there are many ways in which um, foreign investors express themselves, have a voice. And, and there's literature out there. It's political risk literature, um, among other things, that tells us the ways in which uh, companies make their views known to host states, and many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with some of these techniques. But nevertheless, I want to take seriously the argument that uh, foreign investors should be heard. That is, states should listen to investors. And I'm pursuing here uh, an idea that's been um, uh, promoted by Jürgen Habermas in our global um, uh, legal, economic, and political environment that uh, there are many of those who are affected by national laws that don't have a voice, that aren't represented. So we want to take into account all of those affected when we make policy. And that includes not just foreign investors or foreign nationals, but also uh, communities, right? And other folks who might not actually have a voice. Um, it's, it's interesting, for instance, in the TechMed dispute that um, the uh, uh, citizens' movement in, uh, that was opposing the operation of the hazardous waste site because of the environmental dangers that it posed and which were documented by the Mexican government. There was also a push for freedom of information because the local community felt it was left out of uh, deliberations that were taking place between the investor and the city and the state. So freedom of information. So the community wanted to be heard as well. They were affected. <clears throat> and I do this by pursuing the idea of uh, uh, listening, hearing the other side, represented by the Latin maxim audi alterum partum. And I, in the paper, trace some of the um, political uh, theory behind audi alterum partum, which gets taken up in English administrative law and uh, in other English-derived uh, legal systems. And it's not a set formula, uh, but just a, a, a general kind of rule. Listen, hear, deliberate. It does not, you know, a, a, a process-based account does not resolve um, substantive disagreement, but it allows for hearing and dialogue. I examine a number of disputes 
where uh, listening to the other side may or may not have uh, changed uh, the result. Um, I, I talk about Methanex and Kimchura as instances where the investors were heard and wouldn't have resulted in a change uh, in the tribunal's decision. Um, of course, Audi Ultram Partum, I should make clear, is about having local processes, host state processes, listen, rather than having uh, investment arbitrators uh, do the listening. TechMed, I suggest, um, would have uh, led perhaps to better treatment to the investor. Uh, and in BillCon, certainly would have le led to a different result, that is, the investor had lots of opportunity to reply to concerns about environmental hazards before the joint review panel. And then I address a number of counter arguments. Um, that is that there's uh, uh, local host state processes that listen to investors are no substitute for international uh, uh, um, arbitration. Uh, Hugo Periscano makes this uh, argument in his paper. It's distinct from national law, and in some respects, yes, in many respects, no. Uh, ignore, you know, the argument, the no substitute argument ignores the source for the content of much of what constitutes international investment law, including, as we learned from David Gantz, the American Constitution. Uh, it also ignores some functions that investment tribunals perform, as in Bill, Bill Con, performing functions that are ordinarily performed by domestic tribunals, right, by courts within the host state. Um, there are arguments that investment law already provides due process. It's true, there's a hearing. Not everybody's heard from, but there are provisions for doing that. But of course, it's much more than a process. International investment law is enforcement of substantive norms. Um, and lastly, uh, the argument, and this I've heard from World Bank officials, that without ISDS in the background, you'll never get host states to improve local processes, right? Court administration and the rule of law. You need ISDS as a threat, right, to hammer um, host states over the head. And um, and this is this sounds kind of possibly convincing, but. How does one explain then the rapid rise and embrace of ISDS, of BITs and FIPAs in the 1990s into the 2000s when there was no such hammer uh, hovering over the head of host states, when there was no system like that as a threat operating in the shadows? And so I suggest that, in fact, you don't need ISDS as a threat in order to promote rule of law reform of the sort that I'm describing. Now, is this likely? No. Jan Paulsen, in his book, Idea of Arbitration, um, makes note at page 258, I'm ending here, Armand, um, and he writes this tongue-in-cheek, right? He says, some academics have suggested that international arbitration should be jettisoned because its availability stifles the evolution of national courts in institutionally immature states. And he just does not see this. It would require an ethical epiphany on the part of those local judges. Um, in a footnote to this point about some academics, he says this, no references are given. If the reader doubts that such notions could seriously but be put forward in scholarly writings, so much the better. Right. It's better that you think it's just completely made up. So. Um, what I want to close with then is the thought that this is unlikely to um, uh, be embraced by um, international investment lawyers and arbitrators, but uh, I think it's worth thinking about. It also rubs, interestingly, against the law and development scholarship, uh, including that promoted by the World Bank about developing rule of law reform, about improving host state processes, including those that enable um, decision makers to listen to the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Our three speakers have kept to their timetable with exemplary precision and left us uh, uh, 14 minutes for questions. And I would welcome questions to any or all of the panelists. And I would invite any possible questioner to uh, identify themselves and pose their question briefly and concisely. 
Thank you. Please. Uh, Todd Weiler, these are actually just really quick points. Um, it was actually the Carter administration, David, that uh, started negotiations on bits, even though Reagan was the first one to negotiate one. Just wanted to make that point. And with David, um, the reference you made to F.A. Mann is actually, I, I, there's a whole big footnote in my book about it. Um, the, uh, he was actually talking about uh, exchange controls. He wasn't talking about the minimum standard. And um, I could make you the reference for it so you can see it. I'm happy to give you my reference. Well, no, I know your reference. I, I actually, three people have made this incorrect inference before, well, and it's well, there. I, I'm hoping then that your book explains what the content of FET was in 19. Well, as a matter of fact, it does. It, okay, it, it, good. It, good. Interpretation of investment law, uh, Braille, 19, uh, 2013. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Metchell. I'm Howard Knopf, KNOPF. I'm an intellectual property lawyer. Um, I put to whoever wants to take this on um, one case that uh, that has not been mentioned, and arguably it's the elephant in the room, concerns Canada, which is the Eli Lilly uh, challenge, uh, uh, investor state challenge currently pending, uh, where um, uh, to characterize it reasonably neutrally. Uh, Eli Lilly uh, lost a patent case in the federal court, in the Federal Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court of Canada turned down leave to appeal. Uh, Eli Lilly's not happy with that result and has brought a half a billion, uh, $500 million claim against Canada, uh, in effect, um, trying to go over the head of the Supreme Court of Canada. So this is not a claim ab about our patent law, it's really a claim about our jurisprudence. Uh, it's not unrelated to the situation in Australia that was mentioned uh, involving plain packaging and uh, as many of you in the room, probably all of you know, the Chief Justice of Australia, Robert French, who is a sitting Chief Justice, not a retired one, uh, has spoken out very harshly about ISDS and uh, saying quite explicitly that it offends uh, notions of sovereignty and rule of law. And uh, it was interesting that the plain packaging situation was was mentioned here, I, I, I had done some work on that in the past, and it seems to me that, that plain packaging would be a perfectly reasonable um, uh, initiative under health law, and I think some of us would be concerned if, for example, at some time in the future, Smith & Wesson was to bring a complaint that we don't allow advertising guns in Canada and we ban handguns. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, I'm trying to roll a lot into here, but maybe we uh, focus on, on, on the Eli Lilly uh, question and whether or not it it is troublesome for us that in effect um, three arbitrators could overturn the decision of a federal court of appeal and leave to appeal denied by the Supreme Court of Canada. Thank you. Well, I, uh, in my paper, I address very briefly the Eli Lilly case. Obviously, the case is not yet uh, concluded, but uh, a, a few questions uh, um, uh, flow from this case. First of all, there is in, in the arguments of the investors, there is this, they try to make a link between vi well, alleged violation of the intellectual property chapter of NAFTA and that could help to constitute a breach of uh, of the investment chapter, and this this uh, the sort these sorts of arguments have been made in earlier case, and and in that case it seems to to be central in the argument that breach of intellectual property protection in NAFTA would constitute a breach of investment, um, and. That has not been successful before. Uh, there has been a, a, a will, a clear will, to separate uh, investment chapter from other chapters in evaluating if there's a breach of the investment protection uh, uh, provisions. Even the notes of interpretation of Chapter 11 made that clear that violation of another NAFTA chapter cannot constitute a breach of minimum standard of treatment. But the argument is, is put again. A second interesting point there is, in, is that, uh, th th and that goes to what you said about the fact that fair and equitable treatment might have encompassed some aspects of expropriation. And in, in my reading and my understanding, and I'm not an, an intellectual property lawyer, but my understanding of that case is that there's a fair argument uh, 
that is fair. Well, there's an argument that is made that it's constituting pure, a, a direct expropriation, basically, that the, 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 the losing of the, of the patent is a direct expropriation. That's an, an argument that is made, and there were few cases where direct expropriation claims were made, again, not indirect, but direct expropriation against Canada. Um, that is troublesome, I guess, but I don't know to what extent it's going to fall on fair and equitable or direct expropriation. And more broadly, this case, I think, uh, touches on, on something I, 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 I explored a little bit more in detail in the paper. Uh, it's the limit between trade, trade uh, disputes and investment disputes. And the fact that in trade disputes, private uh, investor or private economic operators do not have an international remedy, uh, apart from asking their state to espouse their claim and bring a complaint, try, tend to use uh, investor state arbitration to try to frame or to clothe a trade dispute in an investment dispute in order to get a satisf satisfactory remedy. And this has happened in quite a few cases. And I even believe that it's maybe more likely to happen in uh, relation to investment chapters embedded in free trade agreements. There's like a closer connection between the trade and investment thing than, in, than with a, 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 an autonomous bilateral investment treaty. And I think that's something that has been maybe a little bit underlooked. Uh, is there a difference between an investment chapter in an FTA or a bilateral investment treaty? And I would tend to think that basic treaty interpretation rules that, uh, that makes the interpreter, uh, uh, that forces the interpreter to interpret uh, a provision in light of the objectives and of the, uh, uh, the goal of a treaty, then if you're in the FTA, the goal and the objectives are broader and encompass trade and investment, and there is sort of blurring of trade and investment issues that can lead to, to, to more easily clothe an invest, uh, a trade dispute into an investment dispute. That would be my... Just a short comment. Just we, we have to be careful about how we talk about um, investment arbitration in relation to domestic law in Canada, as Charles Emmanuel has suggested. Canadian courts, in a couple of cases, the uh, CUPE case and um, who Kapatsach, I think, case, um, basically declared that investment arbitration in, is a subfield of international law. It's a separate and distinct legal system having no impact on Canadian law. That's how the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, describes um, international investment law, separate and distinct. So uh, Canada commits internationally. It'll pay damages if it's liable, but we don't change, you know, nothing gets changed internally. So when we talk about um, uh, invest, investment arbitrators overturning a federal court judgment, that wouldn't quite be right. But, but then the courts, of course, have draw this artificial line because, practically speaking, Canada will not want to face a multitude of these kinds of claims, and so will change its policy right? uh, in order to forestall that possibility. It'll have to pay out and then avoid paying out further claims by changing the law Right, and so doing functionally, practically speaking, what you're describing. Well, uh, if I can, uh, brief follow-up, if I can be permitted, I, uh, uh, not maybe a question of changing the law, but what they're trying to do is basically an end run around our courts, and our courts at a very senior level up to the Supreme Court of Canada. But um, what, do you think, do any of you think that the Canadian government was wrong or is wrong to argue this on the merits and maybe should have brought a challenge as to the very jurisdiction uh, in effect for, for Eli Lilly to challenge a court decision. If they want to challenge the Patent Act, fine. I don't think they have a, they obviously don't think they have a leg to stand on. What they're doing is basically challenging, in effect, the court decision. Um, just to, uh, I don't know the case well, but there have been a number of other um, uh, NAFTA cases, Zinian against Mexico, and Lowen against the United States, where it was pretty clear that those tribunals uh, looked at uh, a challenge based on a completed court process in those countries as 
more a traditional international law question of whether there was a denial of justice, not an issue of whether the court, the Canadian court, the U.S. court, the, uh, I guess it was the Louisiana court, the uh, um, Mexican courts were wrong, were wrong or correct, but a question of a very, very high level of uh, review. And I would hope that in this case, I would hope that in this case, um, the tribunal would take the same approach. I think it's, there's, a, there's jurisprudence in NAFTA uh, uh, tribunals that uh, suggest that the standard, the standard at which they're looking is, is, uh, is, is a much higher and more difficult one to meet. Uh, it's not a fork in the road question where you start out in local courts and then you shift to chapter 11. This is a case where you had the entire court process completed. Uh, so I, I, frankly, I would be very, very surprised if the tribunal uh, found uh, in favor of the, uh, of the climate in this, kind of a, in this kind of a situation, just because the, uh, I, again, I don't know who the arbitrators are, but this is very well established, I think, under international law entirely apart from, uh, from Chapter 11, so that would be my guess. And the other point I would make is, uh, you talked about Philip Morris a little while ago. Um, that's the kind of a case I think that would be much harder to win under one of the more contemporary um, uh, investment chapters where you have this, except in rare circumstances, um, health and safety, among other things, uh, are not a basis for an indirect taking. NAFTA doesn't have that language. The Trans-Pacific Partnership will, I believe, the, uh, the agreement with Europe also, also does. Certainly most of can Canada's recent FTAs have that kind of language. In a lot of cases, I don't think it would make a lot of difference, but I think it would make a huge difference here with with Philip Morris. Finally, you, you say the, you talk about the interaction of trade and uh, investment issues, which again is e exemplified by Philip Morris because they're, they're pursuing a number of parallel um, tracks, several of which under are investment treaties, but also one of which is at the WTO uh, seeking to, uh, to show that somehow the uh, Australian uh, actions are a violation of the TRIPS agreement. Uh, frankly, I think the chances of seeing there at the appellate body are exceedingly slim. It's hard to predict what a uh, individual investment tribunals will decide. Thank, thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists for very uh, for opening our our day's uh, debates, and uh, I think Una has a moment too. Yes, thank, thanks very much for a wonderful panel. Um, uh, Charles Emmanuel, David, David, and Aman, that was uh, a great introduction to where we are in North America. So let's give a big hand to the panel. <clears throat> and thank you for the interesting questions from the audience.